Oh, here in the, is this one? Well, uh, as you know, I discovered uh, that there was on uh, sometimes today, but it's fine. You know, I, I had the slides uh, ready. I haven't had the time to uh, review them, so uh, I think I will create <laughs> as I go along. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, I see this as a great opportunity for exchanging ideas, as has already been sort of appeared uh, through the previous talks. And uh, hopefully we will find some times to sit down, like uh, the topics that uh, John uh, wrote on uh, on, uh, on the board, I think, earlier this morning. I think uh, they are quite interesting, at least to me they are, uh, they are quite interesting. And maybe we can find uh, some other topics as we go along. Uh, so I hope uh, uh, to communicate some, uh, some points or some issues that could be of interest. So... Uh the title of my talk, as you, uh, as you can read, uh, will focus on the millihertz uh, gravitational wave signals, uh, which are typical of, uh, uh, of or they are expected to be observed by a space-based interferometer. <coughs> and so uh, I thought to uh, first put up a slide uh, which we all uh, have seen uh, in some forms. Uh, there are three pictures that I'm sure you have seen many, many times. Just to uh, show you the differences, at least to start as a point for then uh, describing the differences between ground interferometers and space-based interferometers. Uh, here we have uh, the LIGO Hanford site, I believe. Uh, and uh, the two uh, sites are separated by several thousand kilometers. Now, these interferometers, as you might uh, know, uh, require two arms. Uh, I don't know whether anybody has ever posed the question. I'm sure you have. I mean, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, s maybe some of the students haven't. Uh, so why do we need two arms and not just one? Uh, I mean, it's a logical question. So and I remember when I, when I was uh, an undergraduate, you know, I remember uh, assisting some uh, presentations, and uh, and you would discover, okay, because you take the differences between uh, one arm and the other, so you know the signal doubles up. I said, wow, I mean, you're investing twice as much for getting twice the signal. So it sounded like an incredible thing. But <laughs> in reality, there is a more fundamental reason why we use the two arms. And the reason is we are canceling the laser noise, so the phase fluctuations from the laser. We are sort of, uh, you know, they are both uh, sent as injected into the two arms, so that they are delayed by the same amount because the arms are equal. And then when they come back at the photodetector, these phase fluctuations go away while the gravitational wave signal remains. And so I'm emphasizing this aspect because in space it doesn't happen that way. It's much more complicated, and we'll get to that. And so uh, this is what, uh, uh, in very rough terms, an uh, Earth-based interferometer uh, does. And so when LISA start appearing on the scene, uh, the first uh, statements you would hear is like LIGO in space. Uh, after all, uh, the Earth is one of many places in, in the universe, uh, so also an Earth base is in reality in space. Uh <laughs> And uh, and so LISA is no exception. But in reality, you have to deal uh, with the celestial mechanics, which uh, uh, tells us that the arms, so the distances between the satellites, uh, are now fixed. And so each satellite follows its own trajectory uh, in the solar system. And so the arm length change, and the sort of the all constellations sort of breathe. And uh, you have uh, an arm that expands, the other contracts. And they can change uh, by quite a bit. So the difference between one arm and the other can be several percent. So if you're talking five million kilometers, it's a significant amount. And so you cannot really uh, take one arm and the light it comes out of one arm and, and subtract it directly from the other. <coughs> you have to play some tricks, which is bad and it is good in some ways. Uh, it is good because... Uh, Essentially, what you do, you send a signal from one satellite to the other two, and you also receive light from uh, the other two. And so, uh, by combining these beams that they come to you at each satellite, 
you can synthesize all sorts of phase uh, differences. And so, because you need to remove the laser noise, so the laser fluctuations, uh, in so doing, you are able to synthesize all sorts of interferometric combination, where interferometric means you have canceled the laser noise, but you still have a gravitational wave signal there. And so the advantage here that you have six uh, one way, so one way means it starts from one point and it ends at the other. And there uh, you have a laser which uh, receives this light and you do the phase difference. So you have six one way phase differences. And if you know this uh, delay, so this uh, lengths, this uh, arm lengths, which in principle are different if you are moving the light from one direction or the other because of the Sagnac effect, uh, the constellation is rotating in, in space. So if you know those distances, then you can cancel the laser noises and you can uh, synthesize uh, all sorts of uh, interferometric measurements. So you can have uh, three uh, Michelson, so you have one, two, and three. Or you can have uh, three Sagnacs going clockwise or counterclockwise. And you can have all sorts of other combinations. And so, <coughs> uh, this just to give you a very, very rough idea about the two, uh, uh, the two kind of uh, detectors, the one Earth-based and uh, the one that are space-based. The other difference is in how you treat uh, the signal that comes into uh, the output from these uh, instruments. In the case of ground-based uh, detectors, the wavelength of the radiation that you are trying to observe is typically much, much longer than the arm length. And so you can use what is called the long wavelength limit in, uh, in deriving your ex uh, the response, so how the signal enters into your data. While in the case of LISA, most of the, uh, uh, the signals that you will observe will have a wavelength which is comparable or shorter than the separation of the arms, which makes a difference in terms of how the response is going to be. So certainly you cannot use a long wavelength limit, uh, almost by definition. So from the point of view of uh, <coughs> the noises, uh, the main reason we want to go to space uh, and, and so detect these millihertz uh, signals is because, uh, as John uh, described earlier here in this plot, the sensitivity plot, Really, as you get down to maybe 30 hertz, or people are even aiming 10 hertz, but at the moment we are not quite there yet, I think. Then uh, the seismic noise, so the shaking of the, of the ground, and the gravity gradient, so the fact uh, that the distribution of mass uh, changes in time, in uh, affect uh, your proof masses, so the, the mirrors that we are using. And so below that uh, 10 hertz or so, then uh, it becomes impossible. Uh, the sensitivity really degrades, it goes uh, vertical, and uh, it's impossible to do it. So only in space, in principle, we can do that. Uh, it's not out of the question that maybe some clever guys, maybe somebody in this audience will come up with, uh, with an idea of how to do it in, uh, on the ground. Uh, but at the moment, uh, we have to think uh, for what we have. So as you might have heard, uh, ESA has put the stamp on, uh, on the LISA project uh, saying, uh, yeah, we are committed to do it by 2034. Uh, with some variations of uh, the design, uh, the most apparent one is they reduced a little bit uh, the arm length from 5 million kilometers to 2 million. Also, I think they increased the laser power output. They played some games. But the the news is that uh, the launch is the launching date is 2034, and uh, and in space anything that has a date is sort of is that date plus X, where X is an additional number of years. So, hopefully, it will be 2034, but uh, we have to see. Now, what I wanted to, uh, well, I spent these minutes to give you a little bit of a background, but I wanted really to focus on. Uh, the data analysis aspects which are quite uh, important when you're trying to analyze uh, the millihertz uh, gravitational wave data against uh, what has uh, been done is, is currently done as with ground-based interferometers. The main point is uh, in the kilohertz band, signal lasts a very brief, an 
amount of time, although we have continuous signals uh, and we are searching still for those. <coughs> But uh, for ground-based interferometers, uh, you're really dominated by the instrument noise. You know, that's really what you are dealing with. While in the case of LISA, uh, which uh, one would expect it to be a very positive uh, news, you have gazillions of signals, and they are all quite strong, especially the one from our galaxy. So I remember when I first learned that, I said, oh, fantastic, you're going to detect gravitational waves as soon as we turn on uh, the instrument, you know, way before LIGO detected gravitational waves. And then it's not quite uh, the case. But anyway, we have to deal with the fact we have instrument noise for sure, and then all sorts of other signals. Uh, we heard about, uh, you know, the supermassive black hole binaries. We heard uh, just uh, a few minutes ago about the emrys. And they're all there, and they all have uh, somewhat of a correlation both in, uh, in frequency and in time. And so if you are trying to detect a particular signal, yeah, you might pick it up, but you also might pick up uh, some others that are also present in the data. And so the question is, how do you handle all this uh, instrument noise, of course, but also all these other signals that are present in your data? And so really, how do we handle the correlations uh, that exist between, let's say, a supermassive black hole binary and some uh, uh, white dwarf, white dwarf binary that is in our own galaxy? So <coughs> let me focus first on, uh, on the binary systems present in our galaxy, which are really the dominant uh, ones. Uh, as we heard, the uh, uh, binary system, you know, spiral around each other, and because of that, they emit gravitational radiation. And because of that, of course, their frequency is increasing. And eventually, uh, you know, they will collapse. Now, we are in the middle Hertz, and so these binary systems, we uh, containing white dwarf uh, stars, <coughs> will evolve in time, uh, but as you consider their evolution, as the frequency goes up, uh, uh, there is a point in which the number of stars uh, that they have reached that point uh, is reduced. So it's gone, uh, there are very few of them. So you imagine that background will be sort of dominating the low part of the frequency, and then as you move to higher and higher frequency, eventually you'll, have, you'll end up having just one signal per frequency beam. And so, uh, in fact, all the estimates of the population of these uh, objects tell you that uh, they cover a band which goes from maybe 10 to the minus 4 hertz up to maybe 2 or 1 uh, 10 to the minus 3 hertz. And above that, uh, essentially, you can resolve them. That means you can uh, pick them up one at a time. In that part of the band, instead, in each frequency band, uh, bin, uh, you might have many of them. And so the question is, how you can you actually resolve them, so individually pick them up? or unfortunately will be just part of the noise. And so, as I said earlier, ideally you would like to put a model of the, of the noise, a model of the background, which I think we have a good understanding how it should look like, and then all sorts of other signals that your model uh, was is contemplating. So it could be supermassive black holes, it, super, it could be emrys, and maybe other, other kind of signals if uh, some uh, clever astrophysicist comes and tells us that there are some more. So uh, talking about the background, uh, this is a simulation that we did uh, at this point is many years ago, in 2005 or something. We wanted to see how a population of uh, 100 million or so of binary systems would appear in the LISA data. And uh, here I think uh, what we did was for the X uh, combination, which is essentially a Michelson interferometer. And the green uh, part is the instrumental noise, uh, the expected instrumental noise. And uh, the red <coughs> is the uh, instrument plus the signal. And so what we did, we injected uh, 100 millions of these signals, accounting for the rotation of LISA over a period of three years, I think, and uh, uh, taking a, a signal which is essentially a monochromatic signal but spread by this relative motion. And uh, we sort of came up then in the time domain how it looked like. 
yeah, as you can see, over a period of, of a year, you get uh, some sort of a periodicity, not surprisingly because of, of the early uh, periodicity of the motion of Lisa around the sun. And then uh, exactly of that, uh, you, ha you are not at the center of the galaxy, you are away from it. But, and so there are times when you actually look towards the center that you get, uh, uh, you get most of, of the signal. And then as you go away from those uh, points, then you get the minima. And as you can see, uh, the two minima are sort of different because of the inclination of the plane of the orbit. Uh, So uh, now this was a simulation with uh, five million kilometers uh, baseline. So that uh, those minima will come down by a factor of two. So in principle, you could start saying, well, maybe if we focus ourselves and not assume to process the whole data stream, but just focus on maybe a few months, two or three months around those minima, then you are minimizing uh, purely by a geometric. Uh, artifact by sort of putting yourself against, uh, so suppressing as much as you can uh, this uh, gravitational noise, uh, it becomes comparable to instrumental noise and maybe you can play some games there, you know. But in reality, <coughs> you have to account for this periodicity. So in fact, what we found uh, digging in, in, uh, in the literature is that uh, this uh, this uh, the equivalent in uh, in the frequency domain. We found that this noise is not just uh, uh, certainly it's not stationary, but is a the non-stationarity is called cyclostationary. And I don't know if you ever heard of this terminology, but uh, in the mat mathematical terms, a cyclostationary. Uh, so let's call. So the expectation value of this uh, data stream, let's say, that would be the mean of t. And that's equal to the mean of t plus some period. So th there is a periodicity in these uh, processes. And, uh, and the correlation also And uh, and so there is an entire uh, literature on on the subject, and you discover that besides the spectrum of this process, there are some additional spectra that you can extract from uh, from this uh, from this data stream, from these measurements at least that you do. And the interesting part was that the this so-called uh, cyclostationary spectra. So the you have the, the zero order spectra which would be the standard spectra, uh, spectrum. But then you have this additional spectrum which are related to the multiple uh, components of uh, the actual distribution of this binary. And so the interesting part in those spectra, uh, if your noise uh, is uh, stationary, are not affected by the instrumental noise, assuming your noise is uh, stationary. So to us was something, uh, and we worked for a while, we, we, we did some, uh, we published a paper, I think, besides this one of the simulation, I think we explored a little bit more how much we could extract about the actual distribution of the binaries in our galaxy. But, <coughs> I mean, we could get, uh, I think, to the quadrupole, uh, quadrupole moment of the distribution. But then I order, I think we start seeing something which was not quite right. And uh, so we start thinking maybe it's the way we model uh, the response. Uh, there was some issues that we never came around there. And so now maybe because of Lisa is going to resume all the data analysis uh, work and so on, we might return to this particular. But anyway, if you guys are interested on this uh, cyclostationary 
process is, I would be happy to talk about it somewhere else. <coughs> well, uh, it's not stationary. So that means uh, that you're, uh, you know, you don't have a time shift anymore. Right? Uh, and not quite, but I can show you. I have, uh, I have the reference. You can, uh, you can go through that. I didn't include the old mathematical details. I didn't want to get uh, a little bit heavy on this, but uh, I can show you. I mean, we have uh, 10 days, so we can, uh, I can show you later on. So uh, to make John happy, <laughs> I, th I thought to, to formalize uh, the problem of how Lisa, in principle, would look for, uh, for everything that is in there. And he has to look for everything that is in there because of these correlations of the signals. And so, as you recall, as it was explained this morning, uh, a way to look at the problem uh, from a Bayesian point of view, uh, the data sample is given to you and is only one. There are not many representations of the data. It's just whatever you have in your pocket. <coughs> what you don't know is, uh, is uh, the kind of parameters uh, that uh, are associated with the, with the signals depending on the model that you are using. And so bias uh, tells us that in reality you, you don't get just one value of the parameters, but you get the distribution of them. Contrary to what the frequencies instead of tell you, you know, you, you get just one set of parameters, but your your data actually is random because there is the noise there. So it's a very sort of 180 degrees apart uh, view of the world. Certainly you can go from this to the frequencies, uh, almost no effort. But vice versa, you cannot do it. So here, what I'm saying is, uh, by proceeding according to the bi uh, base uh, formulation of uh, the analysis of the data, uh, you can extract uh, the distribution of the parameters here associated with it, all the signals and the noises uh, that you are considering in your model given the data and the model itself you, you assume to, to explore. And according to Bayes' theorem, you can relate it to the likelihood and the priors, and this which is some sort of a normalization uh, quantity, which is the integral over all uh, values of the parameter. Now that's uh, in theory uh, how you actually calculate uh, those uh, posterior so-called, so the distributions of the parameters given the data and given the model, that's where really the difficult part comes in. And I think John will tell us uh, more uh, uh, during uh, this uh, two weeks uh, workshop. Typically, they use Marco Chain Monte Carlo, so they sample these distributions in a clever way. But if you have uh, a huge amount of parameters to deal with in the first place, then uh, I think uh, as of uh, today, I haven't seen anything that really covers completely the whole uh, picture. Uh, I've seen papers uh, by Littenberg, uh, and I'm sorry, you might have also worked on this, uh, but uh, yeah, Littenberg has done something similar, and you probably have done it this and yeah, yeah. Yeah, for Whiteworth, I think, yeah, but uh, including Whiteworth and binary black holes and memories and so on. Uh, they are still open problems just by themselves. In fact, the emeries would be an, a problem uh, on its own. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, the model essentially tells, okay, your data contains noise and it contains the signal, and so it's really the signal that, that you have to uh, describe as well as you can. So <coughs> we are dealing with the noise, which uh, in this uh, channel that I described, this uh, Michelson combination, is not visible, it's somewhere uh, there, it's somewhere below. So you have to find a way to identify what that noise is. That means uh, characterizing it in some way, either it's, it's spectrum or it's uh, variance. And then you have to uh, decide what you think you are able to resolve also to detect uh, or something that you cannot really distinguish. In the case of the confusion noise, there are some uh, 
sinusoidal signals due to these binaries, uh, white dwarf, white dwarf binaries, that you will be able to uh, see individually. They are so strong and uh, they happen to enter in just one frequency beam, essentially. Some others, instead, they each frequency beam will contain many of them, and so you will not be able to distinguish one from the other in that particular frequency beam. And so, uh, depending on what you start with, you can say, well, uh, there will be something which I cannot resolve, so I cannot really, uh, for each frequency beam, I cannot distinguish one signal from the other. And there are some others instead that I can. And so, <coughs> actually, at the end of the data analysis, uh, that's what uh, uh, the results should tell you, which ones are resolvable and which ones are not. So how many of these signals are uh, individually identified and, which one are which and the others are not. And besides, we'll need to assess which kind of model. So if we put just just uh, supermassive black hole binaries, let's say, where we neglect uh, the emrays, how do we know that uh, the parameters or the quantities we, we extract about the black hole binary are the correct ones and somehow are not affected by potential emrays being there also? So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, in the case of purely the background, uh, Littenberg, and I think you also did uh, work on that, correct? The full model. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I suspect uh, it would have been. Yeah. So, <coughs> when I talked earlier, uh, about uh, LISA and the fact you can f derive uh, all sorts of interferometric combinations. Uh, what it was pointed out at some point in 2002 or 2003 that you can look at that space of all these interferometric combinations and extract those particular ones, so combinations of combinations, let's say, uh, that have uh, orthogonal noises. So if you would take one channel, this channel A, let's say, and the channel E, and you would do the, uh, the correlations, then the noises will cancel. And similarly, E and T and A, T. What uh, emerged also was that these three channels, two of them are sensitive. So if you put the background again, and that's what we did here, the background really stands up above uh, the noise. Here the noise is blue and the background is red. But this channel T, the totally symmetric one, so to say, instead uh, suppresses uh, the gravitational wave signal. And initially, yes. Yeah, it's typically the round trip light time. Uh, as you approach the round trip light time, you start picking up some sensitivity. Now, in the high frequency part, you can, you can do the null stream. It is sort of the analogous of the null stream uh, for single source, for single source, for point source. And y uh, we derive that expression also in the high part. But uh, the part that really m most affected by this problem was the confusion. It's really this lower part, mainly because of the... <laughs> exactly, exactly. All the way maybe... Exactly. Exactly, exactly. So in a sense, and, and, and I was surprised. We, we start tackling uh, with Julian Sylvester, we start seeing we wanted to find out how we can take advantage of this channel in terms of estimating uh, the noise. Yes, uh, so, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, the A, E, and T, uh, they are sort of specific. T are the three, so if you imagine uh, the three uh, Michelson, imagine the, you know, you have the triangle. Uh, Oh, well, the background is going to be 
reduced by Oh, in terms of noises, you mean, at this point? Yes, I think at that, at that point, uh, as I said here, uh, any gravitational wave signal is reduced by a factor of 100 at least. And so what you have is uh, proof mass noises uh, dominating that region of the band. Uh, possibly, but uh, everything will appear as probed by the light as it goes through the proof masses. We have the model of uh, the noises, yes, uh, as described. Uh, well, well, it's uh, it's the standard LISA sensitivity in a sense. So, so you you allocate something for the acceleration noise, and something for uh, the short noise, or let's say the high frequency noise, you know, the path length noise, etc. And uh, uh, correct. Now, the, the flex is, at, at this level, uh, the effect of, uh, there is another effect, you know, the fact that the relative uh, satellites are moving, uh, there is a Doppler effect. So if I send light from here to you, it will get uh, Doppler shifted. But because it's moving so slowly, you know, the frequency is way below this uh, frequency. Yes, exactly, yeah. Sort of breathing, breathing like a big giant, yeah, like a big giant breathing at night, you know, yeah. <laughs> and so, what we suggested is if we have to estimate from the data, you know, the noise level, we have to estimate uh, uh, what is resolvable and what is non resolvable, you can start first with the noise and so extract all the noise levels that your model contemplates. And, and maybe that answers your question. Or you're going to put uh, in all these other effects. And you're going to estimate for each noise and each noise source is uh, coming from each satellite. And you'll come up with uh, whatever the, the analysis will tell you. And you will sh know for sure that you have probably the best estimate for the noise. It tells you something. Uh, doesn't tell you the whole story, you know. It tells you one uh, one proof mass in in, in a satellite and in an environment which is very different from what is going to be. But it tells you quite a bit. Yeah. And I think they are still uh, they were still taking data at that point. Uh, at least uh, when we were at the LISA, when we were at the LISA symposium, but they switch off. Uh, they were planning to go other six months, correct? Uh, but when when did they shut off? Yeah. Ah, okay. But I mean, I'm referring to the LISA symposium, which was back. Uh, in July 2016. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. For the for the thrusters. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't know that. Huh? If everything is the same, uh, there will be these uh, glitches, yes. And so will be an interesting thing uh, to how to single them out. But I think the glitches, the glitches, you know, th the funny part in Elisa, you know, when you do these combinations, they will appear at specific times, you know, especially if they are like delta functions, let's say. So you can uh, distinguish them uh, from the actual signal. I mean, if you want to think in that way, uh, in a sense, first you have to validate that, that they are not gravitational wave uh, spikes. I'm thinking, but those are, are uh, so are many hundred seconds. Or it must be. Yeah. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah, because of uh and so you would uh, use this channel first to get the noise, and then you would go about uh, the actual uh, signal estimate. 
And uh, well, here are the references if you are interested uh <coughs> to look at this. The latest we did was back in 2003 with Julian uh, at Caltech, but then uh, uh, we sort of stopped there. And I was thinking as I was preparing these slides, there might be something more that can be done. So maybe if you're interested, we can I can share how to go about this particular problem. But and so let's see, what did I do here? Yeah, <coughs> so I it is uh, from that expression that, that I wrote earlier that also uh, John uh, referred to this morning, uh, the bias theorem, how you relate to the posterior, so the distribution of your parameters given the data in the model, uh, and so how you actually calculate it. Uh, as you heard John just saying, uh, it's computationally a nightmare uh, to do it exactly. And so uh, one can try to get some shortcuts. And I'm sure you all heard from when you were undergraduate about the maximum likelihood uh, procedure. Uh <coughs> probably a better way might be the maximum posterior in which you, know, you expand uh, your posterior, you assume that your posterior is expandable as around some peak. And, uh, and it seems that you, by doing that, you remove some singularity in the Fisher matrix, uh, which otherwise would be there if you limit yourself just to the to the likelihood. Anyway, I saw in the in the literature on uh, GRQC, uh, Cornish and the collaborator Robson wrote a paper on this issue. Uh, although they approached the problem of the global solution uh, through a maximum likelihood uh, uh, view, and and they, I mean, to their credit, they say here and there that. There are lots of approximations, lots of assumptions, and so I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, it was propedeutical in the sense it, it gives you an overview of what uh, what to do. But uh, well, what they what they are saying here is that they wanted to estimate. Once you remove, you're not actually removing exactly. You leave behind something. So they wanted to estimate how much is that something there and how it affects uh, the actual. Uh, parameter estimation procedures. Uh, so the title that was in uh, that was announced it was specific for binary black holes, but I think you can imagine that, uh, as I said, that is uh, the problem subsists for any kind of signal. So let's suppose, for example, that you have one single uh, massive black hole binary. So how would you set up the equation? So just to, to give the students maybe an overview of how they would do it. So if you go back and you write the, the signals and, and how the data sort of contain it, you will have, uh, well, of course, instrumental noise, uh, the unresolved contribution, your black hole that you want to see, and you have uh, all the resolved signals uh, that you can actually uh, pinpoint. Now, you don't know yet what this n is, so many of them uh, you will be able to pinpoint. And in fact, one output of your analysis should tell you how many uh, you can actually uh, extract from the data. And so at that point, you have to come up with uh, a, <coughs> a likelihood which 99.999% uh, is always a Gaussian. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and sometimes it becomes useful also to assume the, the prior distribution of the parameters to be Gaussian. Uh, we did that, uh, I think, with Gram and uh, uh, Gram Wom and, uh, and uh, who else was there? It was uh, Anthony Seal and uh, Patrick Sutton. We did that for, for Burst. Uh, we did an analysis in which we could actually do the integration analytically, but that was a much, much simpler problem uh, by assuming the parameters also to be distributed Gaussianly. And so once you have those two uh, set up, then uh, you have to go and use Bayes' theorem. And that's where the fun, so to say, starts. I mean, that's where we, you, you start <laughs> crying probably. I don't know. John can tell <laughs> us what happens when you start trying to solve these problems. but. Uh, Yeah, 
exactly. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, uh, well, uh, and here, I mean, if you assume it's only the resolvable uh, galactic white dwarf, white dwarf binaries, then uh, maybe n is finite, you know, it's, uh, it's 50 to 100 or something. But if you, have, uh, if you have all the black holes, if you have all sorts of other things, uh, then the parameters, the parameter space adds up, yeah. Yeah. No, no, there are. Yeah, yeah, there are even more than that. Even more than that. Now, at some point uh, with, uh, with uh, Andre Krolak, we suggested that the fact that you have more than one bin uh, doesn't really uh, state the problem correctly. You still have the directionality, which plays a role. And they might have the same frequency, but if they come from different points, you might be able still to resolve them. So, in fact, we, po we pointed out that the unresolved ones really stopped uh, the frequency, which is uh, significantly lower than what it was guessed uh, before by just the one bin argument. Yes, yes. But I wanted to be... Yeah, we didn't do, we did, yeah, we didn't do that simulation, but we tried uh, with some examples by putting similar frequency, uh, same frequency, but different positions. And we could, you know, do it, uh, no question. Well, because uh, there is a modulation from the LISA factor. So uh, although at the source they have the same frequency, they are spread in a different way because it depends on the direction. No, what I was... No, but what I'm... The limiting, yeah. Correct, yeah, yeah, the, the, the SNR factor. But I think it's... I think he's right. I think the frequency resolution is not, uh, the integration time is not limiting you there. As long as, I mean, if you have a huge SNR, I think you can resolve better than, than the frequency beam. Mm -hmm. So the
the modulation, I think, uh, is a major effect. I mean, if you have a, if you have a large SNR, then of course you will have to even more. But so, no, I managed to speak for an hour. <laughs> uh, no, no, I mean, but uh, I think it was an hour and a half, right? So it was. So. If I have to think, what would be? I mean, what? Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. It is sort of yeah, yeah. So, but you know, for instance, I don't. S I don't think I've seen uh, papers in which they actually explore all these correlations of the noise of the signals in a systematic way. You know, uh, how much is uh, supermassive black hole binary of uh, you know with ten to the six or ten to the seven? Solar masses uh, overlaps with the uh, binary system from our galaxy, for instance. There ought to be a, but how big is it? Uh, a systematic analysis of this type, I, I haven't seen it. I mean, people make statements, and if you look at Cornish paper, he makes this statement. You know, we have to explore, we have to do it. But I mean, it's really quantifiable uh, how big this problem is. Uh, so I don't know if Wells has been following the literature on this, but. Uh, that's my impression. So maybe one could do, and that should be fairly quick and easy you know, to, to quantify it. And second, uh, we were sort of brainstorming over dinner uh, last, uh, last night. Uh, uh, I have to admit, I haven't read the papers, but uh, Manuel Tilio uh, has written a paper, on, or has several papers, in fact, on how to quickly detect uh, chirping signals uh, using uh, there is a method by which if you get uh, a certain number of points in a parameter space then the most general waveform is a linear combination of those that's the way it's been described to me and so in a sense the problem then becomes linear uh, once you pick up the right point in the parameter space, and there must be a, a criterion for doing that, then that would simplify tremendously. You know, you are dealing, uh, if you think about the Gaussian, uh, all the parameters are linear uh, there. So it might be much, much easier to find the posteriors for those parameters. Yes. Mm Yeah, maybe maybe in his paper was mostly about the, the the parameters of the source itself, and not not the position, and not the. I agree with you. Yeah. Uh. Uh, yes, yes, I know something. Yeah. The one in between. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah.
but you know, my experience with, with Sanjeev is every time, you know, I worked with Sanjeev, you know, I, I would come up uh, with some idea. But then the guy was a wizard, you know, the day, the day after, he was already there with all the mathematical formulation. It was spectacular. I mean, the, the first paper, the copy with the little Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the copy, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Behind that, I mean, I, I sort of, we, yeah, we, we derived the, uh, Physically on physical grounds, you know, the delay here, and then, and then he came back and oh, but there is a space. Uh, the, the, the <laughs> the, uh, yes, uh, and uh, and he formulated everything. <laughs> CCG, yes, yeah, the CCG, yeah, the CCG ring, you know, the ring. Yeah, yeah, it's purely mathematics, but he, you know, he, he picked it up. So. <laughs> no, in fact, I mean, when they talk about subtracting them, I think it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you, you, you can put everything in a model and you're detecting them, you know, together with everything else. It's not that you're cleaning the data. I mean this concept of cleaning, actually, uh, you're dirtying them because you're creating more problems for the other signals that are there. You know, if, if this correlation exists, by removing one, uh, you're sort of interfering with the other. You know. and Yeah. Yeah, I we didn't uh, I know what you mean, the fact that you you know what the uh Yes, I think what we what we did was uh I can show you in, in this uh, paper we did. We have uh, the actual variance of the signal, so the variance of that which is a function of time. And you can relate that to the multipoles expansion of the of the actual background distribution. And then by probing that, you can uh, sort of associate the components to that. Uh yes, I think that, yes, yes, I think uh, that would be very important, in fact. Yeah. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, the so-called unresolved. You know, those are the ones you're going to map. Uh. Oh, I see. Yeah, we didn't account. We didn't account for those. Math benefits. I think it was global cluster. That was uh, yeah, yeah. That's the thing we specialized in. Back more or less in 2005 or something. I think he was talking about that. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Yeah, and I think that was his point. I think you went agree. Yes, I think uh, just by the distance, I think you can see that it's going to be much lower. You know. This one, I suspect it's not going to be visible, but uh, I haven't actually plot put the numbers. Uh, the plots, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, look. So it would be like a factor of a thousand or something down by this value. Okay, but I mean. But if you go to 20, 20, 20 megaparsecs, Virgo is uh, several, a, ta a thousand. Yeah. Ta yeah. Oh yeah, you keep going. You keep going. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but an interesting question. I didn't think about that. Yeah. You mean the 10 to 100 solar masses? But you're talking background, you mean between 10 and 100 solar mass? 10 and 100 solar masses, correct? Yeah. Now, ET, true, yeah, it's point one, yeah, point one, point two. Yeah.
It's hard to say. Uh, it's like to say we will be solving this problem or not. Uh, uh, presumably so. Presumably so. If if we really dedicate ourselves, and I mean, as Sadia was, we were talking early today, I think, about whether NASA, in our case, uh, NASA will provide the support for doing and tackling all these problems, you know, and, and participate actively in this mission. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then Yeah. <laughs> But in terms of the, the machine learning, uh, you mentioned machine learning earlier. Uh, what, what did you mean? Oh, when I was uh, contemplating the possibility of writing a signal as uh, some linear combination. Although, as you said, you know, the, the angular dependence is uh, for sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a question because uh, the spin two is still there, and so those angles enter in that way. You know, with those spin wave spherical harmonics. Solution, yes, yeah. Uh, probably. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Fifth, fifth, a minute? Uh, 34 is 17 years. I don't know what I will be doing in 17 years. Hopefully, it's still around. <laughs> For the field. <laughs> yeah, it's a long time. But you guys, you will be, you, you, you will be around, and they, they, they will be around. <laughs> so I don't know what. Whether any sensible thing. I mean, we can talk about the the cyclostationary processes, but uh, so do you want to talk about now?